Everybody ready? Uh, welcome to the Milford School Committee meeting of November 15th. Um, I do want to announce that tonight's meeting is being recorded. There are several members of the media here, and anyone who wants to make a recording of this, please contact someone on the school committee or the administration. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the approval of minutes. We have one set of minutes to approve. They are the minutes from the regular meeting of November 1st. Uh, did every member have an opportunity to review those, those minutes? Motion from Dawn, second from Christine to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of November 1st. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous in favor. The motion carries. Uh, the next item on our agenda are announcements, correspondence, and distributions. Does any member have an announcement? Well, Scott. Patrick, uh, yes, uh, thank you. I, I had an opportunity to attend um, the vertical concert of the, of the uh, Mil uh, Milford School Music Department. Uh, just want to recognize the kids did an unbelievable job. It was great to see you know, the choruses from, I think, fourth grade right up through high school. Uh, what a great job those teachers have done with them in really a very short just number of weeks here. Uh, kids did a great job. The place was packed. It's, uh, been a long time since I've seen quite that many people in the gym. So just great. kudos to the kids and to the teachers. They did a great job. Very good. Any other member? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I just want to uh, call the board's attention the uh, correspondence from um, uh, Brian Murray. This is uh, addressed to me to express his appreciation on behalf of the Community Field Committee for uh, correspondence in support of our application to the State Plumbing Board for a waiver regarding the proposed restroom concession building at the site of the football field complex. The Plumbing Board voted in favor of the request on October 31st, so our committee will now work to complete this very significant project. You recall this was about the, uh, the, the, um, the bathroom facility requiring some exorbitant number of bathroom stalls in order to it would make it just impractical. So by allowing us to, uh, the school department, I, I did that on behalf of the school committee, uh, they've now gotten that waiver. So it's a uh, Another project going forward in Milford successfully. That's great. I want to just call that to the board's attention. And that facility's been used every single day. There's students on it every single day. And so I think that the, uh, the restroom is going to be a welcome addition, or at least the new restrooms will be a welcome addition to that facility. Any other announcements, correspondence, or distributions? Mm -hmm. The next item on our agenda is the invitation to speak. Uh, did anyone come to address the committee today? Seeing no one, I'll move on to the next item. And Bob, I know that there was some, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to have this presentation today, so that is, we are going to do the bullying presentation today, or we are not? Uh, we are not. Uh, okay. as the student, uh, just to give the, the uh, committee some background, uh, there's a couple of, of anti-bullying efforts that we have. One of it is the, uh, the stand-up. Uh, we've done that for the last couple of years. We'll be sending a delegation of students this year from Stacy Middle School. Uh, to go to represent the Milford Public Schools about our, our, our call to uh, stand up against bullying. Uh, in addition to that is a blackout bullying, a separate event, and this is um, an opportunity where uh, Rebecca Rollo, a high school student, is going to represent, she'll be the designee on behalf of the Milford Schools. Uh, she did go along with Gina Bird, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the high school. Uh, as I understand it, she's out of school for some period of time if she's sick or um, recovering from, um, uh, from from something, but she's not able to be here this evening. So we've put that off to the next meeting agenda, uh, and, and hopefully we can also have the, um, at the same time, we can have the stand-up follow-up. We can just do two bullying presentation uh, updates for the committee. So I'm going to ask the committee just to pass on this item for tonight. Okay, great. Um, the next item on our agenda is a presentation from, um, we have two high school teachers that have come in. They're also the advisors to the National Honor Society, uh, Caitlin Small and Jennifer Letourneau. And uh, we actually asked them to come in tonight just to give us a brief presentation on National Honor Society, um, the acceptance process, um, the submissions that the students have to make, um, uh, what it looks like once they are accepted, and what the rejection process is as well. And so they've prepared a very complete packet for us. Thank you very much. And if you wouldn't mind coming up and just giving us some highlights and, and telling uh, those maybe watching us tonight a little bit about the process and, uh, and how it works. Please do, yes. <laughs> the opportunity to kind of look things through. I think what we attempted to do is to um, to basically list the, the selection process so that you're basically aware of our timeline in terms of um, how it works. Uh, so, um, and then sort of listed documentation to support and, and demonstrate exactly what that looks like all along the way. So 
Um, as you can see, one of the first things we mentioned here is that uh, the whole thing really begins based on academic eligibility. Um, so we request a report from guidance, uh, this year it was administration in the absence of a guidance director, to generate a report of weighted GPAs of students uh, in the junior class. It would be the junior class. They're the first that had the opportunity to become eligible. So um, we received that report. And um, up until this year, it's been a weighted average of 104.0. Uh, but that was based on an old weighting system of 1.3 for AP courses, 1.2 for honors, and 1.1 for college placement. A number of years ago, there was um, a decision to sort of realign the weighting of courses. And so starting with the, um, the junior um, class this year that's becoming eligible in the winter, uh, that has been adjusted to a 96.0. And relatively what that means is for students taking honors courses, we're looking for them to be achieving at a level of at least an 87 or better, uh, which is a little bit higher than what the national standard puts as a benchmark out there. They put a, a benchmark of about an 85. Um, and, and historically, it's been the decision of, of the school and the faculty council to make the academic requirements a little bit more rigorous. Uh, so at that point, we um, put together um, letters of, of eligibility that get sent out to the students to notify them and invite them to, um, to submit portfolios and be a part of the selection process for National Honor Society. So um, ultimately, those are the first attachments that, that you see in your, um, in your packets here. Uh, you know, basically congratulating on them on their academic achievements, um, inviting them to attend a, a meeting where uh, Ms. Mall and I go over the process with them so that they understand what's expected of them and what they need to submit and what the deadlines are. And um, this is um, done in homeroom for the juniors because we're in school during that time. But there's also a process that, simul that takes place for seniors. So if students do not participate in the process junior year, or if they do and aren't selected, they have an opportunity their senior year to, um, to try again if they're still academically eligible. And so this year, those letters went home during the month of August for seniors who, who, were, who were going for um, a fall selection. So there's sort of a simultaneous senior process that happens as a second try for students. Um, so they come to the meeting, we talk to them about the process, and it's usually about a window of two to two and a half weeks where students are having to put these materials together once they've been notified officially of their eligibility. Um, of course, there's a lot of talk, uh, starting with their freshman year, about pulling things together because students clearly, b based on the requirements that we'll discuss, have a lot to do um, in order to be prepared for uh, being selected. Uh, so waiting until that eligibility letter isn't, isn't going to do them uh, justice, really, because there's so much that they have to do. It's not something that they can get the letter and all of a sudden react to. It's something that they have to be prepared for. Is there, is there any sort of a, a meeting or a process that begins before eligibility uh, actually occurs? So when you say mm -hmm. it's a process and that most students probably start Absolutely. that in, in their freshman year, how, how do you communicate? So for example, uh, this year, uh, during the October 17th administration of the PSATs at the high school, there were special programs running for the freshman class during that day. And um, one of the breakout sessions involved uh, Mr. McGilvery, who um, works with student, le student leadership with Mr. Ryan and I working in the same room. And we were able to give presentation to all of the freshmen in attendance that day, talking to them about our organizations. And I was able at that, at that time to, to speak to all of the freshmen that were in attendance at school that day about the National Honor Society. Um, and so we've had informational sessions for underclassmen, um, actually probably for the past, I would say, four years or so, where we invite students that are interested to learn more about the process to come after school. And our officers attend those meetings, and, and so they get to hear it from the student perspective as well. So students are absolutely um, you know, being informed. They hear an announcements all the time about our organization. Uh, and all of our information is also available on the high school website. So it's a very transparent process that way. So students are able to access this information at any point in time. Uh, our information's out there so they know who we are, um, how to find us, so that if they have questions, they can contact us. And we have a lot of questions that come through via email and students coming into our classrooms all during the year. Um, so at this point is where we get into the, the portfolio process, and, um, and that's uh, attachment C. And basically what we've done for you here is we asked permission from a student to black out 
their name and, and, and give a copy of what it is that they have to submit as part of the process. So uh, as you can see, it's, it's pretty extensive. Um, one of the first parts is where they need to demonstrate um, leadership. And the way that we, um, or I should say the faculty council and historically at Milford High School have, have asked for a demonstration of leadership is through participation in activities both in school and in community. And that's measured by students participating in at least three different categories of, of leadership. Um, and they look for a commitment um, for more than a year in at least two of those areas. So uh, really looking for, for students that are, are separating themselves out and are well-rounded um, and, and demonstrating leadership in their participation there. Um, beyond that, uh, one of the most important things that we look for is participation in community service because we are a community service organization ourselves. And so there's a minimum of 40 hours of community service that's required um, for students coming into the organization. And they have the opportunity starting their freshman year to participate in a variety of, of ways. Um, a lot that are sponsored by our group and so we invite students to participate in those events as well and then have the ability most of the students do this independent of anything that's happening within the school um, our students do a lot around the community of Milford in some way activities versus community service so is there one that is carries relatively more weight or one that carries relatively less each, weight? so no each one of these is equally weighted in the process so um, you know, the, the, and, and all of them have to be met in order for the council to decide. So they're looking at, at this big picture here. So the leadership component is one component. Mm -hmm. um, the services is, is another component. Um, academics. The academics is a, a major component, but they wouldn't be in the process with the right. al without the academics. Uh, the character component, which we'll talk about in a moment, is the other piece. And then there is an, an essay or reflection that we ask them to do on service that is also a component. So they have to meet the minimum requirements in all of those areas. Um, at least that's what the Council of Teachers is looking for. And, um, and we look for a majority vote from that Faculty Council of Teachers in order for a student to be selected. Okay. Uh, so students submit their, their service and, and we ask for validation of that service so we can make sure that in fact what they're doing is community service. We ask them to define it. We ask for an adult that is not an immediate family member to sign off on it. And then, uh, so that pretty much qualifies the service component. Um, beyond that, if you, if you turn a few pages, there's, there's the, what we call the character references form, which is one piece of the character component of the, um, of the process. We ask for students to get signatures from 10 teachers within the school build, building that are basically nominating them um, as being in, in good and sound character uh, because we feel that teachers are some of the best ways for us to get a feel for a student and how they conduct themselves um, in and around the building. And so uh, these teachers make the nominations and they, so they uh, approach these teachers much in the same way they would look for a letter of recommendation when it's time to apply for college. That's one piece of the, of the character component. Uh, the other piece is that we request um, a report from administration um, that um, keeps us informed about whether these students that are, that are eligible are uh, meeting expectations of behavior around the school building. So if there have been violations of school policy, um, we, we ask that that information be shared so that we can make a decision um, as to whether that has reflected negatively upon the character of the individual. So with the, with the 10 signatures, much like the grade point average is a threshold issue, are the 10 signatures a threshold issue? And the, then ten, the 10 signatures, they have to have the 10. Right. Um, and as far as the, the reports from, it's not just administration that we seek information from, we also solicit information from the faculty um, in the building. And anything that we receive in writing is presented to the faculty council so that when they're making the decision, they have the full picture. Right. Um, and so th those situations are considered um, before a vote is, is taken for the selection of a student. Okay. And then lastly, as, as you can see here, is uh, the essay, which is a reflection on service. Uh, because we're a service organization, we feel it's really important for students to um, enjoy community service and be able to share with us um, how it's impacted them and why it's a part of their life. And so 
this is probably one of the most enjoyable things uh, or parts of the process. Uh, the, the faculty council talks about all the time how they learn so much about these students based on what they write uh, because it's really truly amazing what they learn from these experiences and, and the types of things that they do. And this student in particular, if, if you read the essay, talks about a service trip to Guatemala, which was pretty incredible. Uh, so there's really some amazing things that our students are, are doing, and these essays are a great way for them to share it. But we're looking for a quality piece of writing. Um, and you can see, um, I think that's a little bit later on in our um, packet here. It's actually attachment M, where you see a collection of the rubrics that the faculty council utilizes to grade the, the reflection. And um, these, are, these are our best and brightest students, and we're looking for them to have taken this seriously and produced a quality piece of writing. And um, so it's an opportunity to, for them to look at, at the piece, and um, we look for a minimum of 40 out of 50 points there, or 80%. Um, and um, starting last year, actually, we've chosen to photocopy these and, and send them back to students if the essay was a reason why someone wasn't selected. So for example, if a junior missed the mark because the essay wasn't quite where it needed to be, uh, then they're able to see the rubrics in the areas where they fell short so that if they choose and are still academically eligible in their senior year, that they understand the areas that they need to work on. Right. And um, as advisors, we're able to help them with that. And does each member of the faculty council read each essay? Yes. yes. So what happens is, is once these come in at, at the deadline, uh, it's a big job for us, but we make sure that every faculty council member has a copy of every single um, portfolio, uh, and we give them time to, to read them and look them over. And there's a matrix, which, you know, I didn't think about that, but I think part of it's difficult because there's student names all over everything, but there's a matrix that we give them where they check off that each of the minimum requirements have been met in all of the areas, and um, we pick a date where the five council members come together, as well as Ms. Small and myself, we're there more uh, to help them and remind them of the, the bylaws and the minimum requirements in case there are questions. Um, and also if, if we feel that um, there are areas where it doesn't seem like there's a consistency across the board or a clarity, we try to help make sure that there is a clarity there with the decisions that are being made. And, um, and they, they have discussion and, and make the votes. Um, so that, that's pretty much how, how that process goes. Great. Um, and then at, at that point in time, once the selections have been made, uh, we notify the, the principal, Mr. Tempesta, of the, of the decisions that have been made um, and also show uh, the drafts of the letters that are going to be sent out to the students. So attachment F in here um, gives you some examples. Um, attachment F is the email we sent to him just to show you how that process works. And then um, the attachments behind that uh, give you an example of the letters that go home to students congratulating them when they are selected. Um, and then there were some examples in there of what it looks like um, to a student when they receive a letter of, of disappointing news, quite frankly. So for students that aren't selected, um, it's a really difficult message for them to receive, uh, obviously, because this is something that they've been trying really hard um, for and have worked really hard at. And so um, I think we've really worked hard on our communication, um, especially I would say in the past six months to a year, to really try to improve on giving the students as much detail as we can about um, sort of what happened. And so uh, these letters have increased, I would say, in detail um, in terms of what we're providing back to them. And uh, you can see that, I think, in attachment I and J, and really trying to reference back to the bylaws and help them to understand where they, where they fell short. And so, um, we invite them to a meeting with us. This has always been the practice where we invite the students back to meet with the advisors to talk to them about what took place as a part of the learning process, quite frankly. And um, in the case of juniors, where they're going to have the opportunity to potentially apply again to talk to them about how to strengthen their portfolio and things that they can be doing now to improve their situation so that in another six months they're in a position to um, have a strong, por stronger portfolio and hopefully put them in a position to be selected. So when these letters are written, are they a form letter or are they drafted by a particular member of the council or is it by the principal himself or herself? As advisors, we take responsibility for communicating the results of the, the selection <coughs> process by the council. And so each one of them is, is, is changed really because the reasons that students are selected or not selected are, are different. Sure. Um, you know, so there are students that are not selected based on 
um, service. Well, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean form as a pejorative. I didn't mean as if there's oh, like okay. one standing you copied. And you said oh, okay. I, I, I assume that you were putting very specific information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, is there a format that you use, I suppose, is my question. Yeah, yeah. there's a standard format that we use, and then we adjust it based on the specifics of the situation. Yes. Okay. And so I would say they don't change drastically um, year over year mm -hmm. um, for the most part, but there are adjustments mostly for, in the case of non-selection. There are adjustments made to be specific to those areas. Okay. Um, so at that point, once the information is made, there's basically a two-week time frame after the selection <coughs> process is over with. The students are invited um, that weren't selected, as we mentioned, are invited back to discuss that situation with us. And there's a two-week window for um, a student and their and or their family to appeal to um, the fac appeal the faculty council's decision to the principal. So if they disagree over a decision that's been made, then they can come to the principal um, to appeal that decision. And that's a, a basically a two-week window. Um, it's happened many times before, um, and so because ultimately it's the principals, um, the principal that oversees um, the National Honor Society and the process um, and the following of the of the bylaws, and so ultimately it is the principal's final decision, um, you know, as far as what um, what students are selected and not selected. Um, we always have participated in those conversations with um, families and students when that comes up because. We've been in the room when the selection process has taken place, and, and we understand the bylaws the best. Uh, so, um, and I think a lot of it is an information process, which is why I'm so glad that we're able to be here publicly tonight, so that you know, as a community, people have an understanding of of what this entails. Um, and so, uh, in some cases, the the principal will appeal to the council and ask them to reconsider. Um, and ultimately, it's been my experience as advisor in the seven or eight years that I've been doing it that the, the principal has allowed the council's decision to be the final decision and that those decisions have not been overturned. Um, so um, at that point, the students that have been selected assign behavior contracts and, and service obligation forms committing to the, the organization. And as many of you know, we have a really lovely induction ceremony that, that takes place in the spring recognizing the accomplishments of, of these students uh, because they've worked really, really hard. And we also recognize the, the seniors who have been participating in the organization during the course of their senior year um, and wish them well in, in their future endeavors in that induction ceremony in March. So, um, I don't know, I, I think that pretty much sums it up. Other than that, they do a fantastic job during the course of yes. the year, and we have a really Very active busy. group <laughs> active group right now uh, that are really involved in doing a, a lot of really great things. Can drive at the last football game. Um, St. Jude's walk on Saturday. They're doing some school improvement. Yeah, school improvement box yeah. on Saturday as well. So they've got a lot going on. They're keeping busy. <laughs> so I don't know if questions? there are other questions. Scott, no, I, uh, <coughs> one of the things that I really liked was you were obviously very thorough. Thank you guys both for coming in tonight and taking time out of I know your busy lives as well. And and uh, really shows a lot of the commitment that you guys have to the students and really to this process, which is you know pretty lengthy. Um, one thing that I really liked about it too was not only certainly being very clear as to the kids that you're in, that you do choose to induct, but you're also telling the kids specifically why it is that they're not. How are you, in addition to obviously giving them that feedback, do they have the opportunity to kind of work with you and, and how are you helping those students to hopefully then qualify again the following year? Um, if they don't get accepted in their junior year, how, do they, how are you helping them with getting them ready for the next time? We have, uh, we allow them to come in for some kind of follow-up meeting if they, it, it's up to them, they so choose to do so, and we'll read over their essays with them. Um, we also offer to edit their essays ahead of time before they hand them in to kind of give them some feedback there. Um, There's also been student workshops where the students offer feedback as well, so for that writing component. Um, we, ha as we said, sponsor a number of community service projects during the course of the year as well, so if it was a service um, area where there was a, where there was a problem, then they're able to gain more hours you know by participating in those projects so it's an ongoing dialogue I would say that that happens during the course of the year Thank you. Christine um, I just have some questions um, more specifics do you have an idea of what percentage of your class or how many applications do you look at a year and then on that if you send out a hundred letters do every one of those students say this is worth doing I've worked so hard for this do you, I'm trying to get an idea of that. And then my third part of that is if they are rejected in their junior year, 
I don't like projected, but um, it, we call it non selected. Yeah, <laughs> I knew it was the wrong word. It didn't sound like. It's okay. Um, if that <clears throat> happens, how many of those students then um, apply again? Are courageous enough to take that risk and apply again? Those are the kind of ideas I want to know about. Here. Sure. This so yeah. this particular year, we had about um, sixty, or last spring, I should say, we had about sixty students that were eligible. We inducted, I believe, forty-eight. And of that 12 or so that was uh, th that were non-selected, I think this fall we inducted seven or eight um, candidates who went forth for the second time and um, tried again and were very successful. Yeah, and I think it was a particularly rewarding year for the seniors that they learned a lot. So those that were not selected, as difficult as that was, we had a lot of feedback from those students and the parents saying how how much of an eye-opening experience it was for those students to go through it, as difficult as it was, and how it made them work so much harder towards the opportunity their senior year, and how um, they felt even so much more proud of the accomplishment because they had had to sort of bounce back from a difficult situation. There were a number of parents that I've talked to that have said that. It's a hard lesson to learn, but I think, you know, on the other side of that, they realize how much they did learn about themselves. I agree. Mm -hmm. So if you have 60, that's one class. Mm -hmm. So about 60 students out of a class, yeah, right, about, would be the About, about 250, yeah. 60 okay. out of about yeah, you're, yeah, you're running, a, uh, you're running around 25, 30%, it seems, that okay. are, are it's hitting consistent. that. Yeah, that's hitting that eligibility mark. Okay. Um, and my next question is the faculty council. Mm -hmm. How, uh, yeah, you have five members, you mm -hmm. said, um, volunteer. Does it change year to year? It does. Not entirely. Okay. Um, so, you know, there are, there are members that um, might continually volunteer over over a period of time. There might be others that drop out and others come back in. Um, so it's kind of a floating body that kind of rotates through. Um, and ultimately, the Mr. Tempesta, you know, solicits those volunteers each year, you know, and and invites back those if they wish to to continue to participate on that council. Like Correct. Based Correct. On his Correct. Faculty that might be interested. Yep. And if someone has a particularly strong interest, <coughs> even if they hadn't been there in the past, um, you know, I, I think that would be open for discussion. Um, you know, in, in that case, and I know when Mr. Tempesta stepped into his role, that w it was pretty much completely opened at that point, yeah. regardless of the fact that we had had five people the year before. He right. kind of opened up the door completely again, um, and we did have some new members at that time that joined and that hadn't done it before. And my final question is, I don't know, um, there is such a thing as a junior national honor society, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And um, why doesn't Milford have it, do you know? I Knowing that you're at the high school? I, I just I don't am know. curious. I don't know the, I don't know the history. history of it or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it seems to me, admirable program. Why can't we bring it down to our middle school? Certainly. And I think, too, if, if it was in the middle schools, it would then almost make it well, easier for students when they get to the high school to be prepared. Absolutely. I, you know, I really don't know. I don't know the history behind that. And, and I honestly, it would be an interesting question to ask the middle school to see if it's something that was ever asked about or, or if they ever mm -hmm. tried to bring it um, to fruition, I'm not, I'm not sure. Thank you, I think you guys have a lot of timing, and I appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Well, thank you. Um, thank you for everything, too, and it's um, a lot of time and a lot of work that went into an organization like this guy's been on our show. Um, you, you, you mentioned, Jennifer, that the eligibility requirement is a little more stringent at Milford than it is in other schools. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if I think I say 87 as opposed to an 85 yeah. average. Um, could that be conveyed to like a college uh, application that you know yes you know Mary or Joe was on the National Honor Society but our um, eligibility requirements are a little more stringent than the others you know is, does that is that ever conveyed to colleges or, or should that be I don't know um, that's an interesting question and I and I don't but know I it'll mean it'll probably help you know what I'm trying to say mm. because like I said if, if, if most are 85 and you know ours is a little more stringent sure to make that grade to make the National sure. Society in yeah. Milford is a little sure. more special, I think, than someone who can only uh, sure. strive for an 85, you know? Again, uh, that's the only question I had anyway, and a great job, and thanks for the detailed information that you gave us. A lot of time and hard work went into it, and it shows a lot of faith in our youth when you have an organization like this. Thanks so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Don, can, uh, have you seen the numbers recently for the years? Oh, I think there's actually been an increase. Um, 
I, I would say that when I first started, our numbers were really, and again, I, I, I didn't do spreadsheets and count before I came, so <laughs> please don't take these as hard, fast numbers, but I remember more my first couple of years, the numbers being in like the, the 30s, and then after the senior induction, maybe low 40s, and I don't want to embarrass you, but you were in, in yes. one of the, the first groups <laughs> that, that I was advisor to, Ms. Small, so yep. um, you I might even we're remember. we're closer to around 30. And, um, and so our numbers here. have increased, and I really do think that has a lot to do with a more open awareness of the program and the requirements being very clear. Because I think it really helps students to understand what it is that they need to do and to get things together, and I think that's really helped um, and it's, it's tough managing the larger groups, um, but they're active. And so we've been able to do so much more, I think, with these larger groups. And um, it's a positive thing. Yeah. You're welcome. How do our, um, the rules that we use mm -hmm. to induct members, I believe that there's a national on society, this mm -hmm. is a national on society, mm -hmm. I believe yep. that there's a council that does um, sort of standardize some of those rules. H how do, aside from the grade point average, which, which Paul already mentioned, um, how do our standards relate to those those national standards in other ways? Are they are the same factor requirements? Is it the same weight? How does that work? The there's a lot. It's left very. It's very interpretive as far as how schools choose to weigh the different areas. Mm -hmm. So they want you to measure the academics. They want you to measure the leadership, the service, the character. That's clear. Um, how you measure that is left up to the individual chapters. But what they are very, very particular about is that you very clearly document your process and that you follow your process. You know, I've had actually a lot of dialogue in my seven or eight years of doing this with David Quartz, who's the, the, the director um, nationally, because we've had questions that have come up. And especially early on, I didn't have answers. So I would defer and, and call and email and say, help me understand this better. Help me understand this better. And if there's one thing that he always said when I would go and ask the question is, do you have this process? Is it documented? And are you following it? And if that's the case, you know, that's what's most important. Um, I think we've really tried to make our um, requirements pretty rigorous for our students. And I think we've, we've had some high expectations and our students have risen to the occasion. Um, I don't, you know, I've gone to a couple of conferences um, a couple of years ago where we were kind of comparing across the board to other s uh, schools in the, in the area. And I would say it's pretty comparable in terms of what we're expecting versus what they're expecting. And, and when a, a student is unfortunately not selected, mm -hmm. um, which factor that you use tends to be the most common factor for a student not being selected? So where, where do we struggle, I guess, as, as a community? You know, I can't, I don't, I honestly, I, I, and I don't want you to think I'm, I'm being wishy-washy on this, I don't really think that there's one that sort of grabs and says, oh, this is the, the problem area. I, I really think that when I think back over the process over these past couple of years, there's a few that, oh, they just didn't have the service. They tried anyway, but right. it really wasn't there, or the leadership wasn't quite there because they didn't have that commitment of, of more than one year in different areas. You know, they picked up something freshman year, and then it dropped off, and they didn't continue sophomore and junior year. And we've had unfortunate character situations that have come up as well, but can I say that there's one prevailing area? No. I think the essay has gotten some students in the past couple of years. I was going to say, I, I haven't been along for very long, but I, I've seen some essays, which is an unfortunate one because of our peer workshops and things like that. Um, I kind of feel like that's one you have most control over as you're handing in your portfolio. And we the, saw the essay essays has been a recently. tough one. That writing component <coughs> has been a challenge for students. And, and interestingly, we have some good conversations with them about, hey, you got to take this as a dry run for the college application process. Right. And that essay that you submit to those colleges when you apply, it needs to be good. It needs to set you apart. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to talk to those students and really get them ready for that college application process. And, and when the essay comes back and they realize that they fell short, it, 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 it wakes them up a little bit and makes them realize just how much work, how much effort, and the quality of the piece that that, that needs to be. Right. And, and I noticed in your enclosure, which again was extremely complete, thank you so much for all the work that you put into this. Um, you did include um, a letter uh, for a student not selected for the purposes of uh, service, I believe, and mm -hmm. also um, one for the essay, which seemed relatively easy to quantify. You know, I'd be interested in seeing uh, a not selected letter for the purpose of character. It seems to me that might be one that's a little more difficult yep. 
to discuss. And I guess I'd like to learn how we convey that. Absolutely. Um, we, you know, we, we, that's something that quite honest with you has been very general and not specific in letters in the past. And, and we've received feedback, um, you know, from, from families and students about wanting to get more information in, in the letter. So I don't have an example of that for you today because since we've made changes and, and improved that communication process, we haven't had a situation come up since then right. th on the basis of character. Right. Um, you know, in the past, I, I can probably quote it, it said, you know, your reason for non-selection was on the basis of character. And right. that's pretty much all it said. Right. Um, and then you were it's invited. It's not specific enough. It I wasn't think. specific. Right. And so, and that but was. that was consistent with our other letters, too. We it, you weren't selected said, on the basis of service. And that was right. all it said, you right. know. And Which, again, so, is probably not specific Again, enough. and it was right. difficult because they were like, well, what about it? What was wrong? Was it the hours? Was it what I did? You know, and right. so it was consistent in all the areas that more information would be helpful. Um, and the character piece is really different because with each student, the reason would be specific to certain events that may have happened with that particular student versus right, exactly, another. Yeah. Um, and one thing when we met with um, Mr. Tempesta this past year, because every year we revisit this process, we look at the bylaws, we talk with the council, what could be better, what could be more clear. And every year there's proposed changes to the process and the the writing and, and clarity of the bylaws to make it better, make it better. And um, one of the things we discussed when we sat down with Mr. Tempesta last year was just the agreement to try to be as clear as possible and really work together collaboratively on the, on the communication piece. And um, I think the letters that were, were put forth this fall were a significant improvement over the past. And These were terrific. That's why that's yeah. why it yeah. brought to my attention that the service one was great and the SOE one was great. Yeah. So, that, that's so we've really, we're working hard at that. And yeah. it should the unfortunate situation happen where we have to convey that about character again in the future, I think we're prepared to, to handle that as, as, as detailed as we can and professionally and carefully as we can. Any other members? Okay, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thanks, really Thanks very much. The next item on our agenda is the uh, presentation from the Woodland, the Woodland Elementary Schools uh, opening of school update. So I want to call we have uh, Mr. Consigli and Mrs. Kincaid. Hi, everyone. Two of our rising stars in the Milford Public Schools. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us today. Uh, the, you know, when I was, I guess, took over the job at Woodland, I did have some real mixed emotions about taking over at Woodland. You know, I. I love Mrs. Burns and working with Mrs. Burns and working with the staff at, at Middle School East. They worked really hard every single day and we, we did a lot. We accomplished a lot, I felt. Um, so uh, in one way, it was hard for me to, to leave that and in, in all I've known really in, in my teaching career, uh, aside from coaching and everything else, is, is the middle school level. Um, and I really love that and I love the kids and working with the kids so I didn't know how I was going to feel but then you know working with Lisa who's phenomenal and really re I can't say enough about it so I won't say anything how's that <laughs> uh, but I didn't know how I would feel about working with the younger kids I, I do have a third grader and a fourth grader at home so I had kind of a, an idea but I absolutely love it. I love working with the younger kids, the, the positive energy that these kids have and, and coming to school every day is, is so exciting for them and they're, they're so happy to be at school. It's, it's refreshing as an educator to, to go into that environment and then to see um, all the programs that were in place. And, and when I took over, there was a lot of unfinished business that's, that's now becoming complete. Uh, we had the NEASC, which I know that, that the other elementary schools came in, and, and I thought that was a very positive experience. Uh, the teachers and staff at, at Woodland worked really hard on that, and to have that group come in and, and to leave the way that they did and the emotional way that they did, I think it speaks volumes for our community at, 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 in Milford to have these, these educators from around New England come in and be teary-eyed about leaving it was unbelievable to me. Um, 
So that came in, and that that was great, and and it, it gave me the opportunity to see our teachers in a different way, and, and to come together and, and welcome other people into our building. Um, the PBIS that's going on at at in the elementary level, but particularly at at Woodland, I think, is really what what is driving um, this welcoming, positive environment that the kids are in. Um, just re reiterating on the the announcements every morning: be safe, be respectful, be responsible, and and to have the kids say it back to you, and it's it's amazing, and and understanding I guess that difference between that and middle school it's and talking that way with these kids and having them understand it it's, it's great and I think it's only going to serve well as it moves forward into the middle schools um, we're rolling out report cards now uh, we had our training with the teachers today which is great and I really really feel strongly that parents are going to be so thrilled with these new standards-based report cards because they're going to tell such a great story about how the child is actually doing. When you look at the standard and you look and see how your child is doing versus the standard, it, it tells a lot more than the simple A would tell you. Um, to know that your your child is, you know, maybe below grade level in in geometry, there's some I don't know some standard under geometry. This is going to be so more telling. You're going to be able to help your child so much better. Um, so I think that's great. Um, I, I did want to tell a story real quick about the first day of school, which, you know, I, I came in with such positive, uh, you know, I had this new construction of how we were going to move the traffic and get the, I, I wanted to really get the cars off the street and get the traffic flowing. So we rerouted the buses all the way around the school, which worked out well. Mm -hmm. But now I had this, this problem of getting the, the cars in, into the, the driveway, and I brought them around the loop um, and to get them off the street. So if you all remember the first day, all of a sudden in the middle of this, I'm trying to communicate with people, it starts absolutely pouring. So now I'm trying to communicate, no, drop your kid off here, but nobody's rolling down the window. And, and, and when I say pouring, I mean there was this much water out in the, in, the, um, in the loop, and I'm standing in puddles soaking wet. People are upset, obviously, because they don't understand what's going on. And, and I guess I had this, <laughs> I woke up, I, get, I got ready to go to work, and I had this great feeling this is going to be awesome, and then... It starts pouring, and, and from there it went. I was soaking wet, you know, and I don't know. I guess it, if that was the worst day, then whatever. We got through it. So can now I, can I, now, it's, now it's like this, and, and everyone knows what they're doing, so it's great. Can I just chime in because you just, so, you just told a very self-deprecating story, and uh -huh. I, I want to tell a different story because uh -huh. I was in Woodland School yeah. uh, on the first day. Uh, with several other committee members, and I, I saw you give your orientation talk to those students, and and I, and I know we speak, you know, on a reasonably frequent occasion, and so I knew that there was a little bit of anxiety going in about different school, different age kids, yeah. and, and you were up there in front of all of those students giving your presentation, and you it looked like it was the fifteenth time you've done it. I mean, mm -hmm. it was so natural, it was so perfect the way that you interacted you. with the students and called for them to speak to you and then spoke back to them in a way that made a lot of sense and it was just I mean it was brilliant to see and it was it was fantastic and Thank I you. knew that that's exactly what you're gonna do I didn't feel like you knew that you were gonna do that and uh, <laughs> it was just it was terrific to watch I don't know, I don't know. Um, but and thank you and, and then you know another thing I never had the opportunity to do is that I always wanted to do I, I suppose is is dressed like Davy Crockett, so I had that <laughs> opportunity to, to read a story to all the kids about Davy Crockett and then have a parade <laughs> dressed as Davy Crockett. I guess I never knew I wanted to do that, but, but I'm glad I did. <laughs> and I think I, you know, I don't know. And then I got to dress as a cowboy, so that, that was pretty fun, too. I don't know. Scott? Uh, yeah, so certainly kudos to both of you guys. I was there all 
also in the middle of that on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely managing Bedlam, you, know, yeah. you guys did a great job of it. Um, you know, I, in addition to being a parent of one of your students at, at, at Woodland, who I heard a lot about Davy Crockett and the Cowboy, um, <laughs> so it definitely made an impression on my nine-year-old. Um, quite frankly, I hear very consistently throughout the community, whether I'm on the soccer field, um, I'm at a music concert. Um, one of the things that parents, some of whom I know very well and some of whom are complete strangers to me, um, I don't know how they find out. Apparently there's a sign we carry around that says school committee member <laughs> that hangs out over top of us. But that being said, um, they really go out of their way to tell me what a great job the two of you, and they mention you very specifically by name, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Consigli and Mrs. Kincaid, are doing with running that school. So I wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity Thank to share you. that with you, you and, and certainly do it in as public a form as possible. Um, doing really a tremendous job and, and I know that you guys don't take compliments necessarily the best way because you get a little ashamed, you get a little humbled by them and that's okay um, and I know that you guys both still see what the opportunities are there ahead of you and really how much more work you, you still have ahead, that you really want to get done um, but I want to make sure that I pass along those kudos to you. Yeah. Christine? So how is the bus It's actually, I think it's working great. I'm working on the bus loop, so Craig has the cars in the morning. So yeah. it goes behind the building, and we have, so we have two um, different points where the kids are going on the bus, and we have teachers who are taking the line of students to the bus. Excellent. Um, so there's always someone um, communicating with the bus drivers, and then I'm right at the front, so once I see all the five or six buses are loaded, I give my signal, and... Um, the kid, the bus drivers start leaving and then the next group of buses come up. So it's working really well. That's at the end of um, the day. So they're lining up. There's one stop near the gym, so they're coming out mm -hmm. the back of the gym door and the other is right near the cafeteria, so we're coming out the side door. And in the morning, I'm there, so we have three buses who do are responsible for other runs like Shining Star and um, Milford Catholic, so I get them off first and our students go in to the cafeteria and then we start the other process with the students. What about the parent drop off and pick up? Because it's always crazy. So it, is it in the loop now? It's in the loop. It's in the loop, oh, okay. it's in the loop and, and mm -hmm. we've... So where do the kids go in the morning? So between, uh, I'm outside at 8.15 um, and usually... It's about 50 kids <laughs> at least hanging out there's there. still, the, the cars come in the loop so they're lined up in two rows, the cars, okay. and then we have lines painted. So we try to keep it controlled. I'm at the end. I let out six to eight kids at a time, <laughs> roll this line up once those kids are on the sidewalk and out towards the cafeteria. On good days, they're outside um, just at the front entrance, mm -hmm. and then they go inside at 8.30. On bad days, we bring them in the calf. Mm -hmm. um, so then we move the cars through. The next six come up. You go to the sidewalk, roll the next six, and just keep going until... So it must have mi minimized that traffic on uh, North Vine now. Oh, yeah, you can't. that was crazy. Mm -hmm. So if you know the school, there's yeah. that, the crossing guard right there. Yep. You're probably only three or four cars beyond that. Oh, that's mm -hmm. right. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And, we, and in the afternoon, we start dismissal at 350. All the cars all the cars are gone at the latest 302. Oh, good. And the bus is by 305. Because people used to line up, like... Mm -hmm. Quarter yep. of two, they be right. first in Right, line. and, and so the frustrating thing is there was there was traffic coming That's both right. ways. Yeah. So this person would cut them off, this person would, and they, I don't know. So it doesn't exist anymore. I would say by 2, 2.15, we start getting some of our cars in. Yeah. There. Well, oh. coming from Stacy. So they pick their, right. their child okay. up at Stacy, and then they start lining so, up. So my next question is, how many students do you have this year? 633. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's your average class size for third grade and fourth grade? Uh, I... I'm sorry, I can't know? speak to that. I, 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 the way, I mean, in years past, it's always been um, coming to middle school so I'm assuming it's the same thing, somewhere between 3.05 and 3.30. So it's probably so in there somewhere. A lot of kids in that building. Yes, yeah. yes. And that, that's it, it's the max. I mean, definitely. The public needs to understand mm -hmm. 600 kids in that building is tight. And, and one of the things that, that Nia said um, is that although it's packed and although we use bookshelves and, mm -hmm. and filing cabinets to separate rooms, 
the teachers, and, and I, I want to stress this, the teachers do a really good job at coordinating activities so they're not interrupting what's happening here. And, the, 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 and again, the PBIS and moving kids through the building, you wouldn't know it, mm -hmm. you know? Right. You wouldn't know right. it. So. I've yeah. always been a big fan of Woodland, always. I think the staff is outstanding. I think yeah. the teachers work hard. I, I can't wait to see where you guys take it. Um, I just think it was just, MCAS didn't do that school any justice, and it's a shame because it really, it, the amount of work that goes into teaching those kids and getting them where they need to be is, is amazing. It's a very dedicated, young, vibrant staff, and we're lucky. Right. Yeah. They do a great job Thank every you. single day. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what more can you ask? <laughs> Chris Craig also been very active with the Woodland School Building mm -hmm. project yep. as well, and that will as we continue with that work. It's um, exciting. Like we started exciting. Uh, at 6:30 this morning together, and yeah. we're closing our day together at night. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and uh, one more thing about I want to speak a little bit about the not a lot, but real <laughs> briefly about the evaluation <laughs> process. <laughs> and and I, I I'll probably get in trouble for saying it, but. I, I really, really enjoy the new evaluation process because it gave me a chance, you know, it, it, it coming from a new building and, and going into this new building, um, I'm sorry, from the old building to the new, to sit down with every single teacher and go over goals and, and basically have that conversation of what are you working on, where do you want to be, um, how do you envision your class going this year? And I, I think for me, that was a great way to, to kick off the year and, and get to know the staff. It was really helpful for me. And then getting into classrooms every day is, uh, you know, it's great too. Any other members? No. Just a final comment to Craig. I want to just uh, publicly commend you for the work you've done. You know, I remember the conversation I had with you last spring. You weren't, you know, quite as enthusiastic about this uh, <laughs> yeah, at the time. Well, well. And, uh, but at the, I, I think you are a perfect match mm -hmm. for Woodland School. Uh, the two of you are a strong team there. Mm -hmm. You've proven it from day one, even before you, know, you hit the ground running. And once we work through some of the mechanics of that transition, I just want to commend you publicly for just a job well done that you continue to do. And you've taken on every challenge. And there have been a lot of challenges there uh, to take on. And you're hitting it head on. And you're doing a, a terrific job at it. So thank you. Keep up the good work. Thanks. You too, Lisa. Oh, you yes. say much. Yes. I know. I'm great Lisa. working with Craig. I think we're a great team. This is a good backbone for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, too. Only about uh, Julie. Yes. Oh, right. Julie yes. is uh, also. She's, great. she's the other backbone. <laughs> Julie Parsons. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item on our agenda is the report of the Assistant Superintendent for Business and Human Resources. Uh, this evening for the committee's approval, I have four warrants. The first warrant is in the amount of $24,440.72. Motion from Mike, second from Dawn uh, to approve the warrant. All in favor? Opposed, unanimous in favor. Um, the motion carries. The second warrant is in the amount of $17,162.45. Motion from Rob, a second from Christine. Uh, all in favor of approving the motion. Opposed, unanimous in favor, the motion carries. The third warrant is in the amount of $63,588.63. Motion from Paul, a second from Scott. All in favor. Opposed, unanimous in favor, the motion carries. The fourth warrant is in the amount of $97,213.69. Motion from Rob, second from Mike. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous in favor, the motion carries. I do have a list uh, of the latest hires since our last uh, meeting. No vote is required. It is for your information only. I do have four jury duties this evening oh, for approval. Would you like me to read them all in sync, Patrick? <laughs> yes. Uh, the four uh, members requiring uh, jury duty approval would be Holly Black, Victoria Houston, Jennifer Mealy, and Joanna Roy. So I have a motion from Dawn, second from Christine, uh, to approve jury duty. Uh, all those favor? 
opposed, unanimous in favor. Motion carries. Thank you. I, I wonder Just that every time I ask. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. I was going to go to jail, so I also have a request for course reimbursement in the amount of eight thousand three hundred and four dollars for the committee's approval. Uh, motion from Scott, second from Paul. Uh, all in favor? Opposed, unanimous in favor. The motion carries. Uh, I do want to update the uh, committee on the financial. Um, we did have an incident in one of our closets that housed all of the math textbooks and um, some curriculum at the high school. And we are in the process of putting together an inventory. We will have to fund from our budget the replacement of those textbooks for the second semester. I believe it could be in the neighborhood of uh, $15,000 just to replace what we absolutely need for second semester. So we're in the process of doing that. We'll be putting together a proposal with the budget transfer request um, hopefully in December. And I just wanted to let the committee know about that. It was a mechanical uh, error and uh, a mechanical breakdown. And when uh, the custodian came in the morning, he found uh, water all within the closet in the hallway. And it was, it was pretty far. So it had, had to have happened overnight, unfortunately. It was a pipe, an old pipe that burst and has been replaced. But unfortunately, we lost textbooks in the, the course of it. Sure. Are they current enough editions of those books that were lost, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that when we replace them, we're able to replace them in kind? Or is it that it's a book that's outdated and now we're essentially replacing with something newer? Do we, is there a need that we're going to have to replace essentially all of them, everything as a result of this? We're actually going to meet with uh, Debbie Small, the department chair, and uh, Mr. Tempesta uh, over the next week to, ter to determine that. Um, if we need to look at it, give Debbie the opportunity where we have to purchase, if she would like to upgrade the calculus in the, uh, the other books that have been destroyed, th this would be the time to do it, if they could do it timely. It's, it is a little bit of a crunch. And uh, that's all I have this evening, Patrick. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda are our subcommittee updates. Uh, the first would be the policy subcommittee. 20th. Okay. It's Tuesday, okay. 6.30. Yeah. Um, to talk about silly use policy. Great. So oh, very good. That policy and so if any members have <coughs> issues that they want to email Scott or myself, so at least we can bring it up at that meeting. Um, and who's at that meeting? Terry will be at that meeting as Terry well because she's a master scheduler. So. Right. Um, yeah, I invited Terry to, to join us. I thought me. she was going to be in Virginia. She flies out Monday night. <laughs> okay, maybe a change of plans. May, but. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we have to come back and revisit that if that's the case. But I did ask Terry to be okay. here um, because she does see that day to day work in the office along with the other four ladies. <laughs> we have all kinds of hands in the facility. Yeah, I think we can talk about where yeah, we need to go Google Calendar, out. something mm -hmm. like that that's a little more current. We, we actually current. purchased School Dude. We just haven't got it up and running with the new IT. Yeah, we just That's coming. It. It'll be on the web school. Okay. Website and it will show every facility what's being used and rented, Excellent. as well as the field. Hmm. It's a matter of time. Improvements. These are good. Um, our next subcommittee would be our safety and security subcommittee. Do we have any updates? Thank you. Well, uh, <coughs> we met this week. Uh, we discussed, as I mentioned in the last meeting, the callback system. Uh, one of the reports that we got, it showed that all the schools are using the same systems, but uh, every single school had its own unique process. So uh, in evaluating that, we realized that one of the comments from the Memorial School is that they were, in addition to calling back, also emailing the parents. And most of their responses were very quick, and, and it was because of the emails. And um, so the system is... X2, that's where everybody enters uh, the attendance. Uh, and then after the first period, it, the names get entered into an alert now, you know, the same alert now system that, you know, uh, we always get calls from. But that'll call out to the parents that, you know, the students um, that were missing. And 
we weren't notified prior. So uh, according to Len, he thinks it's as simple as just checking off a box to add the email. So that's one of the things that we're looking into to see if we can add that, but also standardize it so that all the schools are following the same process. Um, Instantaneously, or was there a delay, or do you not know yet? I don't know yet. So Len was going to evaluate it, and Len was also going to look into, you know, that that solves the problem if your if your if your kid uh, didn't show up for school. The problem is, what if your kid shows up for school and then he takes off? He or she takes off. So one of the things that Len was going to also look into in the system is, um, in the real time, could you actually go into the uh, family portal and actually see if your kid showed up for each one of their classes so um, but I don't know that about this yet so this is something that we're going to continue to look into but we thought that would be a really cool feature if you could actually add that so anyway that's where we are with that um, the other things that we discussed uh, that there was a quick conversation on the uh, and I had mentioned it before there was a leak out in front of uh, Richie Picastavo's uh, room. Bob called me today, said that uh, Mr. Quinn looked into it. There's actually uh, a warranty on the roof, so they were going to bring a crew out tomorrow uh, to, to, to look at it and fix it, So, but that's under warranty. Uh, another thing that came up was, uh, well, I guess you left, uh, Craig Consigli was explaining how uh, the card system, you know, when, you're, when you walk into the I don't know the name of it, but uh, whatever that system yeah, is, the lobby guard system. The lobby guard system. Uh, you know, did alert them of a situation uh, once last week, which was great. It worked. Um, had a concern because that same individual came back two days later, and it didn't alert them. Alert him. Uh, that's when a couple of the other principals uh, explained that the lobby guard system doesn't work all the time. So one of the things mm -hmm. that we asked Len to do was to reach out. Uh, see if it's just a maintenance thing or try to get some understanding as to why sometimes it's it's glitchy so do we even know how to audit that or does Lynn know how to audit that i mean if it's not showing then it's not showing so how would we i imagine it's not an easy thing to diagnose you know uh in, in another conversation i had with craig it's it, could it be manipulated by people coming in too it's not it's not a it's not a foolproof system you know but he was going to look into the mechanics of it anyway to see uh, if, if he could make some improvements. But Craig was really excited that it worked when it did because <laughs> so, uh, it was a great situation when it did. So anyway, uh, Len is looking into this. Um, Mike has informed me that the alarms have been working outside. You know, at first they were going off a lot, uh, but everybody seems to have adjusted nicely to it. And to quote him uh, in the meeting, he said, that our school is a hundred times more safe now having those gates alarmed than obviously having free access, right? Um, and then just as another update, I looked into um, uh, that double alarm tripping process where, you know, somebody always had to go to the school every time an alarm went off and 99% of the time it was either a smoke detector with a battery or a piece of paper blowing in front. So since the double alarm system uh, was put in place by Mr. Quinn, not a single situation where anybody's had to come check out the schools. And then the other thing was on the courts, there were zero appearances uh, in October and only one scheduled so far in November. So that's it. Great. Can I say that? Of course. Um, first of all, the court thing is October, it's November. You know, this stuff takes all year before the courts are flooded with anything that happens in the building. So I think that's kind of a it's great. Uh, let's see what happens at the end of the year. My, my concern is with the, the security. Part of the reason this committee, if I remember correctly, was formed was because we no longer have a director of security. So we wanted to assure that things were getting done. But no do ill respect to our committee members, I think our job's getting a little gray here. We can't, we're micromanaging security when we should just be updated on security. We're getting like, I'm a little concerned about our school committee role on this policy and what the policy, what this, this committee and what the purpose of the committee is. 
I think that we've already seen major benefits from this committee. Mike Tempester has expressed to me that he's seen a major benefit from the interaction of the principals with school committee members, where there wasn't a forum in the past for them to share some of the problems that they were having. Um, and so I think so long as the administration feels that it's productive and positive and they're not pushing back, then I don't see any reason to change its charter or to modify it in any way. I don't. I'm just wondering what its charter is, just to meet monthly so that they can go through the security of the schools? I, I don't know. I, I'm just curious. Yeah, I think it's to take, you know, any and all investigatory steps to find out what the best security policies are to make sure that they're enacted so we can come away with a, a directive. Um, I don't want to go so far as to say a, a manual, but um, a, a process and list of processes whereby the committee will no longer need to be involved in these pieces. Uh, moving forward and I don't think that we put a timeline on that because we know that seasonally as you've pointed out with the court seasonally what happens with our schools and the necessity of having security in our schools changes as we go through that that school year so I would imagine that it's going to be probably a full year where this committee is meeting and they are touching upon the different security issues that we have and then I would expect at the end of the school year to have a complete report to find out uh, what needs to be adopted I have a feeling that this monthly meeting with the principals is something that will definitely be go forward. Um, every single principal that I know that's been participating in it thinks it's terrific. So I, I think that that's one concrete example. As to the rest, I don't know because I'm not intimately involved in it, so I would hope that Mike and Don would let us know. I just feel like we are playing too big a role in things that are happening in the security of the school. We can advise, we take under policy, but you know, we charged Bob and the building administrators with taking care of security. And I don't disagree that a monthly security meeting should be a standard, but I'm not sure. I think we have to be careful of where our role comes in that standard. That should be noted. Yeah. I mean, I know that we have concerns. I, I, that's incredibly valid. But typically, we've taken those concerns and said, this is a concern. Let's form a policy. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think we can be too secure in these buildings. And I don't think that the school committee can be too informed of the security issues that we face. So. Um, you know, again, I'm going to follow the lead of the committee and the, of the subcommittee, and, and whatever advice they give us, I'm, I'm happy to follow that. I think a lot comes out of communication, Christine. There's a lot I, of I communication gaps, and when we sit down in the room and we discuss it again, this week was another example of it. You'd be surprised. I don't think we're micromanaging anybody. I think it's just conversation, and the gate was a big one. We found out about the gates, you know. The, this week we're sitting in the meeting, and while we're in the meeting, Mike Tempest is on his laptop. You know, flipping through the cameras at the high school while he's conducting the meeting. So I, I think it's a very beneficial thing, to be honest with you. I really do. If I can add to that, but all of these things that uh, have been pointed out are, are, are not issues that Mike and I are bringing up as much as it is the principals are the ones that are bringing all of these things to the surface, which is honestly the best benefit of the forum, in, in my opinion, because. You know, it was like Craig talking about the lobby guard. It was the police officers talking about the gate. It was, um, you know, all these other suggestions that are being made by them that is, is really, I mean, I, I think it's a great format, and it's, and it's certainly in the benefit of all the kids. So um, in all honesty, the involvement isn't really from Mike and I as much as it is getting them together in a room and then discussing it and then us seeing it through. It's nice. admit to it was how do you know your child's in school all day and particularly that was at the high school level but it it really opened up a conversation that was geez what if he he or she does go in in the morning how do I know and you know we never solved it but it really brought out some good ideas of maybe things that we should be looking at at the high school level to make sure that the, they're safe and in in school like they should be you know and again it was in conversation that it came up I don't, again, I am not disputing whether there should be a monthly meeting with the administration of the school system. Just, I think our role has to be clearly defined in that administration of security in our schools. That's it. Any other member? The uh, next item on our agenda is new business. Does any member have new business? Paul? Just uh, more or less some in information. Um, on this particular uh, topic that I wanted to bring up. Um, a parent came to me uh, last week and asked and said that he saw something on ESPN that was more or less um, bringing to light high school athletes uh, 
that play across the country some severe contact sports. And by doing that, you know, there are some that get severely injured, like to a, like a catastrophic in injury. And um, throughout the years, it takes, you know, of course, it's, you know, the recuperation period sometimes, you know, would take months and years and sometimes a lifetime. And they were showing various athletes, you know, be it football or soccer or whatever, that would have severe brain injuries, be paralyzed from the neck down or from the waist down. Um, and, of course, you know, the, they have a limit. Some schools uh, have a limited insurance policy. And, and after that kicks out, the parent's policy would actually kick in, and there's a certain amount of money that each policy would give a family. And I guess it, sometimes it costs millions uh, of dollars to keep these individuals alive, more or less, or to, you know, in, in their convalescent stage. And um, the, there, there's a movement in some of these schools up in the uh, Midwest and in the South to get catastrophic health insurance as a um, mandatory benefit for school di districts to, to, to pick up in case this does happen. I mean, of course, it's, you know, the, the risk is very low of happening, but it's still a, a distinct possibility that it, that it would happen, and God forbid if it does happen, we just want to make sure that uh, families aren't put into foreclosure or in the poor farm be because of this. So I just want to know if Kathy or Bob or whoever would know if we do have that type of insurance policy. I guess it's a catastrophic health insurance policy. The high, it's a high de deductible, so I guess the premiums are pretty um, lower, you know, compared to what other insurance policies are. There was one particular school that was looking into it with a population in their district of 6,000 students, and it would cost them like $12,000. And of course, you know, that's still a steep uh, uh, price to ask in these economic times. But what they were going to do is use their booster club or maybe raise the price of a ticket to a, a dollar, you know, like a, a dollar more to help contribute to this, you know, um, extra cost. So I was just wondering if, you know, do we have it or should we consider having it if, if, if we don't? I, I can speak to that. Um, currently, all of our athletes in every sport have uh, what we call interscholastic um, health insurance coverage, and that also includes our cheerleaders as well as our marching band. So we are covered uh, throughout all of those interlastic sports. What I can tell you, Paul, is that we do have a million dollar coverage policy on each one of the athletes, as well as a zero uh, deductible, zero dollar deductible, $10,000 dentistry coverage for a year. That's, that's the difference though, Paul. Right now, our policy only takes the injury for one, excuse me, one year. So if we wanted to do something uh, I could look into expanding the year coverage. The coverage for Milford for that particular policy is 3000 a year. So I could look into a multiple year policy if the committee wanted me to uh, look into a cost analysis yeah, with our current coverage. The committee would, would uh, uh, be, be in favor of it because there are some, mm -hmm. like for instance, those that they were showcasing, these particular athletes. One young fella got hurt on the football field paralyzed from the, uh, the neck down and, uh, as we, at, when he was 16 years old. He just died this past year at 27. Um, and I guess uh, his policy that fortunately his school did have it. They had a $5 million uh, ceiling. And once that was over, I guess the parents now had a kick in. And of course, with an injury that bad, you know, you're talking about nurses aides around the clock. You're talking about uh, different beds and different, you know, setups and whatnot, and God forbid. If it ever happened, you know, I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, there's most parents, you know, like families that can, again, they can put them in the poor farm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, I just think it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be a good idea. And again, it's, it's not an exorbitant amount of money, I think, with the act of uh, boost the club that we have and in, in, in the act of um, at, at athletic uh, parents uh, that we have, I think it would be, you know, pretty good money to raise, you know, and we give them a, a purpose too. And again, it'd give them that, security blanket too that you know there is that security net out there in case something happens i remember uh, just a couple of years ago um a young fellow playing hockey for our for our team i don't know if he was from our town but when we joined te teams with blackstone um got hit in the chest and you know god forbid he he you know he's alive but he almost died yeah. you know in in, a, in that you know uh, particular um injury could have been a lot worse mm -hmm. 
you know, so it's something that, again, you know, and just by watching that, you know, from that when the fellow was telling me, and I did see it, you know, uh, and, and it was, you know, it, it was awakening, you know, that you say, you know, I mean, we take it for granted that our kids are protected and we try everything we possibly can to protect them. But I guess if we go with that extra step, it'll be a lot helpful for everybody. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, I don't know that we need to vote on that. I, I would certainly support investigating okay. that. Let's I think there's a lot of value in it, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Over the last couple of years, think about hockey and lacrosse, and I think they're great programs. <clears throat> and the coaches do a great job, and the kids do a great job. But I think something like this definitely, I mean, at the end of the day, our job is to protect our kids. So, right. do, great do, suggestion. Do you, do you review the insurance policy on a yearly basis now, Kathy? Do you they, do that? The, they actually, after our bill is paid, they'll send it to us. So I just happened to get it about two weeks ago. And um, it just caught my eye with the marching band. Coverage so, and I mean, looked. Otherwise, it's, it's automatically just renewed every year. Every so year. we don't we don't really have we haven't sat down and and looked at it, so what, what you know what it's covering. Do, and I apologize. Do we have an do we have an actual and, and forgive me forgive my ignorance on this. Do we have an insurance agent in essence that would be able to it's sort a, of look at our policy and kind of do a. I mean, the advantage of having an agent is they give really give a comprehensive overview. Mm -hmm. And be able to say, "Hey, listen, here are where some holes are," and and maybe give we some advice. We could use our agent. Currently, this policy is dedicated dedicated, excuse me, to just schools. It's a school written policy that has an underwriter. But certainly, we could call and, and have them do a cost analysis, see if they have a similar product that we could just expand a few years on. That's great. All right. <clears throat> uh, do any of the members have new business? One piece, um, Patrick. Um, it, it's something that it brought to, was uh, brought to my attention by a couple of uh, residents, as well as I had an opportunity. I was at a, attending a soccer game at the at the at the field, and again, what a great facility it is. But I'm noticing, and it, I guess I got some phone calls from some residents that um, it, there's a lot of trash that's starting to c accumulate. There's some bottles that were lying around. It's starting to not fall into disrepair by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not. If I think about how we want to represent ourselves when others are going and using that field, it's probably not, in, from a rubbish perspective, probably not the way we perhaps like. Um, I know I kind of reached out to you, Bob, preliminarily about this, and I know that you were doing some research this afternoon on kind of what we can do to hopefully get that resolved very quickly, A, and B, work on the maintenance piece. Uh, the Parks Department maintains that that uh but certainly we'll work with our facilities with rob quinn and i reached out to rob today after you had called me on that and uh, rob will connect with mike brashani tomorrow um and they do and they will they will get the trash cleaned up they know they try to, to stay on top of that we purchased about 15 trash barrels for that field so we just would appeal to the citizens people who are using that to put your trash in the barrel i mean the trash barrels look beautiful yeah, they they're everywhere i mean yeah. quite, quite apparently they're not full which is a problem i think so i would just ask you to find your way to one of those barrels and throw it away it'll it will it will help but they are going to address having that cleaned up so yeah, <laughs> right okay yeah absolutely get that corrected next item on our agenda is old business does any member have old business Uh, Bob, we had, we had talked about, um, as we're going through as a policy subcommittee, um, you'd mentioned that you were going to be working with teachers and getting soliciting feedback from teachers and administrators around uh, policies and procedures. You mentioned on the November time frame for being able to just wanted to see if you had a quick update as far as when we could expect to see some additional follow-up on that. Yeah, the competition has really, uh, with, with staff, I've been having that uh, individually as I walk into rooms or as I walk through hallways with teachers or in small groups, uh, curriculum committee meetings. Um, there hasn't been any specific reference to policies, per se, that are getting in the way that I've, that I've come across yet. Um, but I'll continue those conversations as we go along. There are, there are certain things around, you know, they need, uh, it, it somehow morphs into a, we need LCD projectors, we need smart boards. It becomes, it becomes sort of a wish list conversation as opposed to, you know, what's getting in the way. So I'm trying to really separate that out. But um, I will continue to talk with staff as we go. Uh, and it's been, it's, it's been it, I've taken a lot of notes as I've gone on this, and we've mapped a lot of things that we'll see in the budget meetings, ideas that are put forward by staff members of things they need in their classrooms. But it's not gotten to a policy conversation level at this point as to what's in the way. But the conversations continue. I've not made my way through every teacher yet in the district. I'm pressing onward. 
Okay. Thank you. And I have an old business, just an update for the committee on the school building project. I mentioned it earlier when Craig was presenting. Uh, just very quickly, the, um, the school building committee met uh, the, the subcommittee for selecting the owner's project manager. Uh, met this morning at 6.30 to interview um, two, two finalists that this group has did narrowed it down to from the submissions, the part of the bid process for the owner's project manager. And now we're doing reference checks on those two. Um, we'll actually be, uh, several of us will be visiting some of the sites that the, um, the OPMs have, uh, have led the charge on. Uh, and then we'll come, the school, uh, the subcommittee will come back again to make a final recommendation. We'll then have a school building committee, the full school building committee, to make a recommendation, take a vote ultimately, and bring that person on board. And then we begin the next part of the process for the, for the project of selecting a designer, an architect. The owner's project manager, who's our, our advocate, the town's advocate, will be instrumental in designing that request for services, that RFS. And we'll continue to go on from there. So the quick the quick version of this is that we're well within our timeline with MSBA, uh, with what town meeting voted, and making good progress with that group. Okay. Well, if you have any specific questions, I could try to address them. I wanted to keep it brief. Um, let you know that it's still ongoing. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is executive session. Uh, we do have an executive session tonight. Uh, it's for two purposes. Uh, one is to discuss a, a personnel matter. Um, which is not public consumption, and the other is to discuss a uh, grievance from the teachers' union. Uh, we do need a roll call to enter into executive session, and if each member of the committee could please assent by saying yes or dissent by saying no, I'd really appreciate it. So, Mike? Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Uh, so we will now be going into executive session. We will not be returning. Um, so thank you very much.